So a cardinal died and went to heaven. All right, all right, let's not start with a crude joke. And to be fair, it would make no sense. We don't know if cardinals go to heaven, but they do die. And today's painting is about the death of one special cardinal, Cardinal Henry Beaufort, best known for his political scheming and financial acumen. The death of Cardinal Beaufort is an uncharacteristic artwork for its time. For one, it is quite literal in its interpretation of the Shakespearean tragedy. Oh yes, William Shakespeare, the man relished for his contributions to English literature and the European theater. The bard, whose prose has an unrivaled sing-song quality, whose verses have an irresistible charm. The playwright, who wrote those oft-quoted lines, You are a saucy boy, and what, you egg? This silly man wrote a series of plays called Henry VI, discussing the political lives of various figures involved in the Wars of the Roses. One of these people was obviously Henry VI. When this painting interpreted a scene from Henry VI, Part II, in the late 18th century, not everyone was pleased. People thought that the artist, Joshua Reynolds, had done a disservice to the playwright's work. After all, he had drawn a demon in the scene. Wait, what? One critic claimed that some fiend had been laying siege to Sir Joshua's taste. The major criticism was that visual arts should not depict fantastical creatures in this way. Poetry and literature have that license because they are instruments of the imagination. But to blatantly unleash a fiend on a cardinal's corpse was a little off color. But wait a minute, were we not supposed to be talking about some dead cardinal? Yes, 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 the dead cardinal is very much a big deal, but that's because the alive cardinal was an even bigger deal. We need to go through the alive cardinal to get to the dead cardinal. Wait, that came out wrong. In any case, let's get back to the story. Shakespeare wrote three plays about Henry VI, titled parts one, two, and three. Then he wrote another historical play called Richard III. These four plays regale the entire saga of the Wars of the Roses and form the Henriad, a tetralogy that established the Bard's merit. Speaking about European wars is hard because there have been far too many and many of them have gone on for far too long, and many of them overlap one another. But let's take a brief overview of how this state of, let's say, violent unrest came about. The English fought the Hundred Years' War. It was not an actual war, but a series of conflicts with the French only to exacerbate their own socio-economic problems. Due to some structural problems of the English feudal system, let's not go into it, the nobles started infighting. It was a fight between two sides, the House of Lancaster and the House of York, both cadet branches of House of Plantagenet. Henry VI of the House of Lancaster was a weak and mentally unstable king, so Richard, Duke of York, challenged his legitimacy. Like an old, retired pro wrestler on WrestleMania, this is where our Cardinal makes a surprise entry. <laughs> Beaufort was the second son of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster. He and his siblings were declared legitimate by the Pope when their parents married each other. However, he was barred from succession to the throne. Little did anyone know that it would not stop him from getting as close to it as possible. He was nominated the Bishop of Lincoln in 1398 and was consecrated later in the same year. After his half-brother, Henry IV of Lancaster, deposed Richard II, he made Beaufort the Lord Chancellor of England in 1403. Henry Beaufort now held public influence, but he gave up the position the next year to become the Bishop of Winchester. He wielded considerable influence over the Prince of Wales and the later Henry V. So when he ascended the throne in 1413, the bishop was brought back as Lord Chancellor, only for him to resign three years later. The Pope offered him the rank of Cardinal for his mediating services at the Council at Constance, but Henry V did not want him to accept it. That was not an issue because the dude was a political big shot. He knew his time would come. After Henry V died in 1424 and Henry VI succeeded him, the bishop's time came and he became the Lord Chancellor once again. Lord, does this Chancellor thing even mean anything? It seems like a ruddy old game of musical chairs. But this time, things were different because he refused to resign. Why? Because he hated Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester. Humphrey was liked by Londoners and had been on an expedition to Hainaut. When he returned, Beaufort, who was hated by the Londoners, confronted him. Things escalated, riots happened, and Gloucester charged Beaufort with treason, charges he denied. The accusation was not proven, but Beaufort felt the weight of defeat. 
he resigned as chancellor once again and accepted the cardinal's hat offered by the Pope. He was appointed the papal legate for Germany, Hungary, and Bohemia to aid in the Fourth Crusade. His return to London to raise money for another crusade reignited his feud with Gloucester, who kept trying to deprive the cardinal of his see. The historical context of this rivalry serves as a great starting point for the play, so let's jump into Shakespeare's version of the events. Be prepared, this is about to be one wild ride. King Henry VI marries Margaret of Anjou, who is in cahoots with William de la Pole, for the Earl of Suffolk. Margaret and Suffolk plan to influence the king, but Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, is a thorn in their side. Suffolk manipulates Humphrey's wife via necromancy, for which she is arrested and banished. This proves to be a cause of great embarrassment for Humphrey, who loses his prestige and position. Suffolk then reaches out to the Duke of Somerset and Humphrey's arch-nemesis, one Cardinal Beaufort, to upend Humphrey completely. Suffolk and the Cardinal hold Humphrey for trial, accusing him of treason. As Humphrey gets imprisoned, a new problem rears its head. It seems like he will not be convicted. With this realization, the crew of backstabbers start to panic. One of these is the Richard of York, who thinks to himself, my oh my, they are fighting among themselves. Maybe no one will notice if I just go sit on the throne. These are not Shakespeare's words, by the way. The Cardinal finally decides to deal with Humphrey as he teams up with Suffolk. Suffolk's cunning backfires and he is sent into exile. Meanwhile, a servant of the Duke of Suffolk gives the Queen news of the Cardinal. The King arrives at the deathbed of the Cardinal, who was also his great uncle. Don't know how I forgot to mention that. It is at this moment that artist Joshua Reynolds finds our Cardinal, burdened with guilt, overridden with despair and filled with the fear of death. The King, Henry VI, looks to the heavens and cries out, O oh, thou eternal mover of the heavens, look with a gentle eye upon this wretch. O oh, beat away the busy meddling fiend that lays strong siege unto this wretch's soul, and from his bosom purge this black despair. The artist materialized the king's words, the meddling fiend in the painting. Now, it might seem quite understandable why this choice raised so many eyebrows. Several people demanded that the fiend be painted over. Let's forget about the attempt at censuring a great work of art and just think about the choice itself. Why did the painter make this choice? It is interesting to note how the phrase meddling fiend jumped out of the page for him because that is just what the cardinal was. The man was made chancellor some 50 times. You're telling me he was clean? His petty scheming sowed the seed for further political chaos, enabling a rift between the two dynasties, a rift that would result in the brutal wars of the roses. The year the painter made this image is the same year he lost the sight of his left eye, forcing him to retire. As such, the death of Cardinal Beaufort was one of his final works. What a triumphant way to go out. Over the years, the coats of paint and varnish during early restoration efforts had redacted the fiend. The National Trust, an English conservation charity, undertook the project to restore the painting to commemorate Joshua Reynolds' 300th birthday. The result is a fine work of art that dares us to express ourselves fully. And if that means throwing a demon on a cardinal's corpse, so be it. Like the painting? Hate it? Let us know in the comments. If you found this discussion interesting, don't forget to leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. That's it for now, and we'll see you in the next one.